and not only that, but we don't have to like deal with running a company. So you buy it for a couple million dollars. The first thing you do is you go and you borrow as much money as humanly possible. You leverage, which means borrowing against borrow. every every piece of machinery in the game. And then you take all that money and you use it to expand. You go into new markets, you go to China, you buy new plants, you hire a whole bunch of MBAs, you fire half of them because they don't know what they're doing. You get McKinsey to come in and do this big study. And actually this works. Five years later, you have a company that costs a couple million dollars to buy. Now you've expanded all over the world. And if the market's going up and you've called things right, you can turn around and you can go public with it. And once you share, sell shares to the public, you get to take all the quick. What surprised me most about this story is the degree to which private equity touches our lives in ways that we're not aware of. You know, a shop at Albertsons probably doesn't know that it's private equity owned, or someone who eats at Outback Steakhouse but has no idea. There's really no way to tell. Outside of financial circles, many people don't realize the scope and influence of the private equity industry. The number of brands is astonishing. And what most people don't realize is we, all of us, in one way or another, actually are invested in many private equity deals. When I was in business school, there was nothing sexier in this entire world than private equity. It's exactly where you went if you wanted to. What surprised me most about this story is the degree to which private equity touches our lives in ways that we're not aware of. You know, a shopper at Albertsons probably doesn't know that it's private equity owned, or someone who eats at Outback Steakhouse would have no idea. There's really no way to tell. Outside of financial circles, many people don't realize the scope and influence of the private equity industry. The number of brands is astonishing, and what most people don't realize is we, all of us, in one way or another, actually are invested in many private equity deals. When I was in business school, there was nothing sexier in this entire world than private equity. It's exactly where you went if you wanted to one day own an island. And one of my classmates just bought an island. But what is private equity? How does it work? And what happens to the businesses that fall under its control? Businesses like the Simmons Betting Company, which has recently announced it's filing for bankruptcy and will emerge with yet another private equity owner. I think the best way to think about private equity is to think of somebody buying a home, trying to fix it up, and then selling it. The only distinction is that typically the buyer is often playing with other people's money. Money that could come from your pension fund, your insurance company, a college endowment, or large charity. So let's say, for instance, that you have a company that's been owned by one family for 60 years, and the president is the grandfather, 
and the vice president is his son, and you've got seven family members working in the accounting office, none of them ever went to business school, they have no idea what they're doing, and they have zero debt. And you come in and you say, look, I'm going to buy you guys up for a couple million dollars. And they say, a couple million dollars? It would take us five years to earn a couple million dollars. We'll do it right now. So they, and not only that, but we don't have to like deal with running a company anymore. So you buy it for a couple million dollars. The first thing you do is you go and you borrow as much money as humanly possible. You leverage, which means borrowing against something, every, every piece of machinery in the, in the joint. And then you take all that money and you use it to expand. You go into new markets. You go to China. You buy new plants. You hire a whole bunch of of MBAs, you fire half of them because they don't know what they're doing, you get McKinsey to come in and do this big study. And actually this works. Five years later, you have a company that cost you a couple million dollars to buy. Now you've expanded all over the world. And if the market's going up and you called things right, you can turn around and you can go public with it. And once you share, sell shares to the public, you get to take all those proceeds. Or you exit some other way by selling the company or something else. These deals really assume that a company companies' revenues are going to go up because these are booming times and there will be more than enough money for everybody, including paying down this debt. This is not the situation today. Simmons is a great American mattress company. It's been around for over a century. Its products and brands are ones that we use every single day. It was immortalized in a Cole Porter song. Its advertisements were included people like Eleanor Roosevelt. It's a big brand, it's an iconic brand, and it's an American brand, and it's a brand that's now in trouble. In a Wall Street version of Flip This House, Simmons has been bought and sold by five different private equity firms, each looking to make a profit, and is about to be sold again. You know, the private equity, their goal is to make money, clearly for themselves and also for their investors, which are pension funds and endowments all over the country. For the company itself, its goal is to survive, to thrive, to become operationally better, to become financially stronger. Sometimes what you can see in these deals, though, is those goals aren't necessarily compatible. It's normal for a private equity firm to increase the amount of debt on a company. Some debt is almost always used by private equity investors when they buy a company in the first place. But for Simmons, each time it was taken over by a private equity firm, the amount of debt on the company doubled. So the private equity company that owned it has made a huge profit on, on its initial investment, but that profit translated into debt for the company over and over and over. Its fifth owner, Thomas H. Lee Partners, took out debt not just to invest in Simmons, but also to pay itself a dividend. It's leaving the company with a total of $1.3 billion in debt. And that might very well pay off for the employees and for the private equity owners and for everyone else. But it does expose the employee to more risk because there is now a new chance that your company's gonna go bankrupt. Employees like these who used to work at a Simmons plant near Atlanta may not even know their company is being run by a private equity firm. They may not know that the new owners are looking to cut costs which can mean plant closings, benefit cuts, and layoffs. We're all from Simmons, this group sitting at this table here. Um, we got 22 plus years working at Simmons Company. Every time a new owner come in, it looked like the company went backwards to me. The pressure to produce became stronger. And, and I believe that was due to the fact that um, some cutbacks. By cutting out people's job, it put more pressure and stress on the person that was there. A lot of employees that have lost their job attribute the job loss to the decline in the mattress industry. I think a lot of them believe that um, the industry's sales are down, which is true. But I don't think a lot of them understand how much debt this company has on its balance sheet and how that's actually a much more of a driving factor right now to what's happening at this company, rather than anything that's happening with the economy. The company's debt wasn't the only thing that former Simmons factory workers did not understand. Uh, had you guys ever heard of Thomas H. Lee before they bought the company? Thomas No. I still don't know it. I still don't know it. Thomas H. Lee. Where are you from? Out of New York? That's who bought it, Thomas H. That's who bought the company now, right? Thomas H. Lee? Did he? Never heard of him. Never heard of him. 
September 18, 2008. As workers arrived for the day shift, they were called into a meeting. Due to a drop in sales, they were told the plant would be closed permanently. They were not allowed to return to the shop floor. And to come out and do it like they did, it could have been a better, they could have did a better way, I think. It really was a hostile ending. I mean, anytime <laughs> you close the plant and you bring police to the plant, I mean, they brought in police like, I mean, like, we're going to tear the place up. I think they set the plant because we were unionized. I think we were unionized and, and they play, you know, and they paid people in our plant more than they paid people in the non-union plants. In a press release issued at the time, Simmons said, the decision to close our Atlanta manufacturing facility is a very difficult one for us because of its impact on loyal Simmons associates. Due to weaker than expected business conditions, we simply could not justify maintaining two manufacturing plants in the state of Georgia. The workload would be shifted to two nearby plants, neither of which were unionized. After they closed the doors, the morale was low. I mean, the morale went down, people didn't know what they were going to do, where their uh, next check was going to come from, where their meals was going to come from, how their mortgage and stuff was going to get paid. A bunch of us stayed in contact, you know, just to see how, how each other was doing, you know, but there's a lot of people still who don't have jobs. But whether this is seen as harsh treatment or an effective improvement on a company's bottom line can be a matter of perspective. For Simmons top management, uh, working with private equity firms was a huge boom. Uh, they received all sorts of fabulous perks. Um, the CEO, Charlie Idle, um, who was with the company from 2000 until just last fall, had country club dues fees paid, had the uh, captain of his yacht paid for one year, received thousands of dollars in free mattresses each year, along with you know great salary, bonus, and equity stake in the company. A spokesman for private equity owner Thomas H. Lee Partners said Mr. Idle's compensation was in line with industry standards. The employees, the biggest perk that they sort of work for at this company was upon retirement, they would get a free mattress set. And unfortunately, that perk was taken away last year. Sim was always gave an employee that retired a new set of beddings. So, and they also gave them $20 a year for every year of service that, they get, that you was employed there. We asked them, about the people that want to retire, can they retire and would you still give them that mattress and that money? And they still said, no, no, we, we're not giving you nothing. What has happened is really the worst case scenario for everyone. Simmons has announced it's going to be going into bankruptcy. When it comes out of it, it's going to have a new owner. The winners of the deal are clearly Thomas H. Lee Partners. Um, they've made a profit of about $90 million. They actually consider it to be a disappointment. They were looking for a return of two to four times their investment, uh, which is in line with what previous private equity owners had made. They walk away with a profit, but it's small. They also, though, believe that none of this was their fault. Uh, they believe they've left the company operationally in better standing than when they bought the company uh, six years ago. And they also believe that what happened was sort of the perfect storm. Um, that what happened to the economy and what happened with consumer spending had not been seen ever in the betting industry history and was unforeseeable by anybody. The other winners in the deal is probably Aries Management, which is the new private equity firm. Um, they've gotten this at a good price. The debt levels will be manageable for them. The losers are the employees, which have already seen the workforce cut by about a third likely to have more, more job cuts down the road. Uh, the bondholders lose big. Even the industry loses because there's questions about what happens to the Simmons brand. So why do companies just shift hands from one private equity group to the next private equity group to the next private equity group? One of the really big reasons why is because of how the private equity industry is structured and how people, private equity professionals, get compensated. So it, Let's say I'm raising a private equity fund, the Charles Duhigg Fund, and I'm going to raise a billion dollars. The way that I get paid is I get what's called 2 and 20 usually, which is 2% of the money that I have under management and 20% of the profits. 
But I only get that 2% once I've put the money to work. In fact, I only get the money once I've found a deal to put it into. Otherwise, it just stays with my investors in my investor's bank account. So let's say that I've promised everyone that I'm going to put all the money to work by year four, and it's now year three, and it's a billion dollar fund, and I've only put 500 million, I've only invested 500 million. Now I've got a year to put 500 million dollars to work. And what's more, if I don't do it within the next year, in some of the, the agreements I signed with my investors, they get to keep the money. They don't have to give it to me at all. So now I'm out there and I've got 12 months to put $500 million to work. It took me three years to put the other $500 million to work. I'm literally going to do any deal I possibly can. As long as it's not going to blow up in my face, I'm going to look like an idiot. If you bring me a deal and you tell me, look, the price we're selling it at, it's going to be the exact same price three years later, I'm still going to do that deal because then I can go to my investors and I can say, look, I found a new deal. They're going to, it's going to cost $300 million. Now I get 2% of fees on $300 million. I don't have to give the money back. Everything is happy. So the question then becomes, why does the guy on the other end of that deal do the deal with me? Why does he give me the company for $300 million? The reason is because he's in year seven of his fund. Things are about to shut down in year 10. And what he promised everyone was, we will be exited out of all of these investments by year 10. Now, let's say that this guy has exited out of no investments because the stock market is down and because he can't find any buyers and because it turns out it wasn't such a great deal in the first place and he overpaid. What he's gonna do is he's gonna say, look, as long as I can find a buyer who's willing to like, give me a price that isn't embarrassing, I'm gonna get out of this deal. Because then I can turn to my investors and say, look what a genius I am, I got us out of this deal. And by the way, I did it before year 10, which means that we all get to keep the money and I get my percentage that I am promised. So you have a whole bunch of guys sitting in sort of a daisy chain. And even though there isn't any economic value being created by handing companies around that daisy chain for the company itself, you're creating economic value for the professionals who are handing them around because they get paid to basically do deals. That's what happens on Wall Street is you get paid to do deals. There's a big question, Mark, over what value the private equity firms bring. The industry has been trying very hard um, during this buyout boom to present itself as creating jobs, to present itself as improving operations. The private equity industry argues that its ownership results in healthier companies, more jobs, and a stronger economy. Its companies can make decisions for the long term, free of public scrutiny and quarterly earnings reports, and their returns benefit large pension funds and university endowments. However, the industry still struggles to improve its public image. Before private equity was called private equity, it was really an LBO, a leveraged buyout. It was a term that people didn't really like because it talked about leverage, it talked about debt, it talked about adding debt onto the top of companies and became synonymous with firing people. I don't know if you recall uh, the movie Other People's Money with Danny DeVito. Amen. Which really illustrated what private equity uh, was at some level. The villain is the private equity guy. But what he's really doing is he's coming in, or she, and saying, let's make hard choices that we should have made, that you guys should have made years ago. Now I'm gonna force you to make them. I'm gonna take all the criticism, but I'm also gonna get rich when it's all done. Take the money, invest it somewhere else. Maybe, maybe you'll get lucky and it'll be used productively. And if it is, you'll create new jobs and provide a service for the economy. And God forbid, even make a few bucks for yourselves. As a nation, we basically say, capitalism is a is destructive creation. We indulge the destructive part. And when you indulge the destructive part, a lot of people make a lot more money than some other people. And private equity did that very, very efficiently. And they were creating better markets. They created better companies. They made markets more efficient. There's a lot of good that comes out of it. The period from 2003 to 2007 was a golden age for private equity. And as the deals got bigger, so did the amount of debt used to make them happen. During the buyout boom, there was a new twist. 
companies would borrow even more money to pay their private equity owners special dividends, which allowed them to cash out well before they sold the company. More than 188 companies that were owned by uh, private equity companies issued this sort of debt to the tune of about $75 billion. So that means $75 billion went to private equity firms, but is now debt on these companies' balance sheets that they're having to pay off. From a private equity investor's standpoint, it was a great thing. And then they could know we got our money back. And then they may care about the company because if the company does really well, they will make more money. But if it hits trouble, they're out. Now keep in mind, the only way that you can actually do this is if you can convince some banker to loan you a gazillion dollars. The banker could very well say to them, OK, but you can't use it to pay yourself special dividends. You have to use it to actually build something. In which case, they do. And if the banker doesn't say that, then it's not really the Tommy Lee's fault for making a buck. It's the banker's fault for being stupid enough to give them money that they weren't going to invest in the company. And now is the fallout from that bubble, just as you and I are struggling to pay for that house with the debt we can't afford. These private equity firms have created, have built these companies up and have so much debt on these companies that are now worth so much less than they were a few years ago. Once the credit markets contracted, once banks decided that they couldn't loan money anymore, the idea of private equity has actually disappeared in some ways, which is to say that private equity can't buy businesses anymore with leverage. In the same way that the homeowner can't get the mortgage, the private equity guy can't get his mortgage either. And so the whole idea of this hot potato game of buying and selling these companies has come to a screeching halt. And so there's a big question about the future of this industry. There are a number of companies that are in Simmons' position, um, hundreds of companies across the country that have a ton of debt that have been put on their balance sheet by their private equity owners. And now, like Simmons, are struggling to figure out how to pay that debt and stay afloat. And what we don't know is what would have happened to those private equity companies um, without private equity? Would they have hit just as much trouble if they were publicly owned? We're on fairly delicate ground. And if there was a seismic shock, it could set off a wave of bankruptcies. Um, and it's very difficult to recover from a bankruptcy. Now, the world may change again. And as we're already seeing, there are investment banks like Goldman Sachs that are uh, reporting these uh, remarkable earnings. And so I wouldn't count these guys out just yet. Um, there's a cycle to all of this. Uh, there was a period in the late 80s when people said that private equity was done with. And here we are talking about it right now. So. Okay, we're going to play one more video that is um, um, I'm sorry. I mean, that is the African approach. Uh, there was a debate, a very critical debate um, that I wanted to share with you as well regarding private equity in Africa. So I'm going to share it now. Let's be patient. At the end of this, we will wrap things up and, um, and maybe have a little chat. So in case you have a question during this um, video presentations, please be putting those questions on the chat. And I'll be writing them down so that when, we, when at the end of this next video, which is about 40 minutes, then uh, you would have a chance to, to ask your question. But it is critical that all of us uh, take seriously investment in our continent, Africa. Without it, the hands of entrepreneurship will be held. That is why we're making every effort, even these small little efforts, to start figuring out what it is and how we can access it, build it, so that it is not someone else's, but ours, and then we can leverage it. So this is the next video, please. Um, I think we are ready for, to hear from investors. So my approach will be very simple, is to pose some question to the, uh, to the panelists and then I'll leave a floor for, you know, for, every, for like four or five people to you know, ask some critical question to the, 
to the investors because this is a golden opportunity even for me to sit with DOB. You know, it's, it's not something easy. So just to start, I think um, it will be great for, for the two panelists to introduce themselves because I know Michael has done the same so that we know who we have here. Uh, so welcome, Eva. Great. Thank you. My name is Eva Warigia. I am uh, the Executive Director at East Africa Venture Capital Association. It's actually East Africa Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. We are the trade organization for private equity and venture capital funds acting as the intermediary between enterprise and the capital sector. So it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome, Eva. And now, Bridget, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? No. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, it sounds like you have been trying to get in touch with me, and it was very difficult. Um, <laughs> Um, I'll give you my number, you call me and I'll pick up, no worries. <laughs> good, good. Um, so my name is Bridget van Dijk, I'm the CEO of DOB Equity. Um, I'm a private VC, private equity investor um, with an office in Dar es Salaam. I'm based in Tanzania and you're right, I'm afraid. I'm one of the very few private investors with an office in Tanzania, um, but also I'm happy to announce that ever since um, we put foot here in Tanzania, we've quadrupled our portfolio in Tanzania. So I think it makes really sense and I see a lot of opportunities. Um, maybe um, just very briefly about DOB Equity. We are a single family office private investor uh, with roots in the Netherlands. Um, we are an impact investor. What does it mean? Is that we are a long-term uh, investor with a um, um, with the objective to put growth capital into early stage or um, more mature companies with the aim to get a decent financial return. Uh, but more importantly also to drive social impact in terms of creating employment and um, give companies access to capital for them to grow and provide quality and affordable goods and services to the end consumer. So it's impact both financial returns as well as social impact um, um, through private sector development. Um, very briefly, we invest in all of East Africa, um, so we have exposure in five countries, Uganda, Burundi, Rwanda, Kenya and Tanzania. Um, my background, I've been in private equity venture capital for more than 20 years. Uh, across the globe, that sounds big, um, I'm just a Dutch person that happened to work for companies with a global scope. The reason why I would like to mention is that I have experience investing in Europe as well as Latin America, Asia and across Africa. So we will reflect on Tanzania later and I think you know, I've got some reason to be able to compare Tanzania to other markets. I'll leave it here for the moment. I think we should, um, we should thank uh, her for coming here. You know, we have a few VCs in Tanzania. I think DOB, they have a HQ here. <laughs> That's a great thing. Most of them, they are based in Kenya, so it's good to be here. <laughs> and Michael, you can give us a brief about, um, you know, you and how you are interacting with the PE. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I tried to keep the intro short before. So, um, you know, I work for Clyde & Co. We are a, uh, you know, we're a large global law firm, 53 offices around the world. And we've also got the largest fully integrated presence here on the ground in East Africa. Um, I'm a partner, I lead the corporate M&A and private equity practice, uh, one of five partners here in Tanzania. Um, and yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, active across the region, but you know, by nature of the fact that we've you know, built the business originally here in Tanzania, that's been the core of where we've uh, you know, done, our biz done, done most deals. Um, in terms of um, stuff that's been announced, I mean, we've done deals with Catalyst, 
Um, we've done deals with Africa Invest. Um, we've done deals with, uh, so we acted for a very large uh, hotel chain who just did a $56.5 million deal in Zanzibar. Um, I think one of the challenges here in Tanzania is that most deals are not announced, which makes it quite hard to promote and tell you about all of the things that we have done. But um, despite um, you know, discussions around, oh, there's never any deals in Tanzania, et cetera, that simply isn't true. There is, there is a decent pipeline, as I'm sure Bridget will attest to, um, but you just probably have to dig around a little bit to go and look for it. That's great. So, Eva, there is this issue of um, US and China. We have seen, like last year, that um, China secured over 32% over of all the investment that we have poured in the, in the PE environment. And the US is around 49%. So, the two, the two countries, they are taking around 79% of the total investment that is, um, is done globally. What is so special about these two markets? Um, if you ask me, what is special about those two markets is they've been in existence for over 200 years. And so they've had pretty much all the time in the world to create the structures and infrastructure necessary to develop uh, proper financial systems that allow investors to readily, with quick turnaround, um, deploy capital in those markets. Having said that, um, I also think it's a bit unfair to, to compare where we are as Africa to those markets. Our needs are different. Um, there's a lady called Dambisa Moyo who's an economist and she wrote this book about Africa and investing in Africa. So when she, she gives a comparison of investing in those markets versus here. And I think the earlier panel alluded to it. When we invest in Africa, we are investing to solve real problems, to, to, to create real opportunities that have a real impact on real people. Sometimes in the developed markets, in part because they've been there for so long, they are innovating to stretch their imagination. It's Elon Musk and going into space. Here yeah, we are still grappling with the challenge of water and sanitation. So it's not so much why, uh, yeah, so that's the other point, um, the fact that because it's real problems and real people, we sometimes have to be, to take some time to think about how to execute properly because we have actual impact on real lives. And then the third one is um, the, the capital is from those markets, so it's pretty much people lending to people they already know. Whereas in Africa, we're still, uh, as Michael pointed out, very dependent on foreign capital to invest in our private sector, including startups. So until we can create systems where we are raising money from the continent to invest in co the continent's businesses and opportunities, I'm afraid those markets will continue to be the leaders. And I think after those China, I mean, US, China, the third one is going to be Europe, and then the fourth one is East Asia, and it's because those markets are able to raise money from their own um, regional economies to deploy to their startups, to deploy to their enterprises. So it's also a challenge for us in the industry. How do we start mobilizing the money available on the continent, whether it's from our family offices or generational wealth, our pension funds, our insurance companies, um, our sovereign wealth funds um, to invest and catalyze um, enterprise on the continent. So if you ask me, they have the infrastructure, but also they have the capital on the ground that they're willing to invest in their own markets. Uh, but Bridget, in the last four, five years, China investment was around 4%. In 2018, it went to 32% of all the PE investment. You know, this is a big raise from 4% to you know 32% globally. So, what is missing um, in in our region? I think it's um, difficult to compare U.S. China with um, with uh, East Africa, um, just as a shortcut. I think um, it would be interesting to see where the money has been coming from that has been invested in US and now in China. 
Uh, I tend to believe that there's a lot of capital being unlocked if the opportunities are seen on the ground. Um, so uh, US, I guess, is famous for its high level entrepreneurship and also high level angel of uh, capital being made available by angel investors. Um, so I think there's a win-win for both the invest the entrepreneurs, sorry, as well as the investors. For China, I think same. It will be interesting to see where the monies are coming from, but usually capital flows where there is um, a large demand and um, an understanding of proper entrepreneurship, and as you are rightly pointing out, Eva, where there is an environment that enables investors um, to safeguard their exposure, meaning a legal enforceability um, support to entrepreneurs, a high level of skilled um, labor force, a uh, good level of education, but also, for instance, well-developed capital markets. I think uh, for each and every investment, uh, investment is just the start. Every investor will look at also how to divest uh, from that investment. So you need to have uh, decent capital markets, stock markets, a secondary market to buy assets, uh, market for mergers and acquisitions. So there's a whole lot of different variables, in my view, that are needed to make a country very attractive. And then, as you already pointed out, uh, Mike, is you need good stories. And I think that is also something that East Africa needs. But you can only have good stories, obviously, if there is good investments. So um, I'm not too pessimistic about East Africa, because if you looked at the capital raised for Africa uh, maybe 10 years ago, it was very, very small, and today, I agree with you, Mike, there's a lot of capital flowing into Africa, there's a lot of capital raised, yet there's too much capital now going after too few deals. So what we need is really a revolution of entrepreneurship in Africa, East Africa, Tanzania, um, to show that the investment opportunities are here, attract the investor to the region, um, and start making good investments and create those success stories. But it will come, it is already happening, but yeah, we're all a little impatient maybe, but I see good, um, good developments already uh, happening. Oh, great. But, but Mike, uh, the few deals that you've closed in the country, uh, those investors that have, they've come in this country, what they told you about our country, maybe the opportunities that um, maybe other global investors they've not seen here. Maybe can you give us a brief for the few deals that you've, uh, you've closed? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, uh, it's more than just a few, Andrew. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, we've, done, we've done quite a few. Um, look, I, I think just, just to address the wider point first before we drill down to Tanzania, yeah, it's all about risk versus reward. And, uh, you know, and as Bridget said, 10, year, 10 plus years ago, there was a relatively small amount of money being raised for investment in East Africa because, relatively speaking, it was very, very high risk. And frankly, the, the reward opportunity was relatively low. Now, I'd say what we have seen over the last 10 years is a change in the uh, like when you look globally, it's still high risk. These are super frontier markets, even in Kenya. But the reward opportunity has increased. And you know, as we see, you know, countries, you know, economies grow. You know, there's a gr you know significantly growing consumer base. Um, you know, that opportunity again continues to grow. So you see. The risk level still remains high, but the reward level sort of creeps up. And I think it also has to be viewed in, you know, in the round about what's happening in the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is not in great shape economically. In most markets, you know, you look at the US, it's kind of on a just bumping along the bottom. China, we're seeing a slowdown that in a way that hasn't happened for 20 years. Europe, I mean, let's not even talk about England and Brexit, but, um, you know, so there is a, you know, so, so I, I do see a paradigm now where, you know, yields drop elsewhere, P 
people start to have to look for new markets, which can only play to, uh, you know, to the benefit of East Africa and also to Tanzania. Um, what in particular attracts people about Tanzania? I mean, there are, there's such an enormous list about, you know, as to why you would invest in this country. You know, you look at, you know, the natural resources, the, you know, the, the stability of government, the, um, you know, the, the fact that, you know, you've been able to deliver economic growth over the last 20 years, you know, at around 7% GDP. You know, when you view that against a lot of other African countries, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things that are attractive. I think there are, of course, challenges as well. And, um, you, know, they, you know, I suspect that's probably for another question for us to drill down to. Yeah. But it's things like, you know, if you look at, I don't know, you look at like an opportunity in, um, I don't know, if you were to invest in agri-processing or edible oils, for example. I mean, you've got a population um, you know, here that, you know, everyone is eat, eating a meal every day. So there's a huge, huge opportunity just there. And I believe Tanzania is a net importer of edible oils at the moment. So you know, I, I guess the, the multitude of opportunities is almost endless. It's, um, it's almost a difficult for people to pick where to go. Yeah, sure. Uh, but from a side, Bridget, you know, when we went to pitch events, um, normally investors are asking us that, you know, I don't invest in a company because you don't have traction or you don't have a quality team. But you have a good idea. So I'm asking, why DOB is not using an approach of, um, you know, invest and build my company? We build together, you know, then you have a good exit. Why the invest and build approach is not common in this market? I think every investor looks for um, a company that can uh, is innovative, so unique in its uh, sector, in its segment, um, and that is scalable. So a company that can really grow and where you have the strategy and uh, projections that a company can grow, uh, also to create um, economies of scale internally, but also become more profitable. Um, but to execute such a strategy, you need to have quality teams. Um, scalability, innovation can only be driven by the skilled entrepreneur. Um, just to have the idea and not being able to bring together a team of people then who can execute it, I think there's very few investors who might uh, be interested in doing so. Um, fortunately, I've met um, a huge pool of um, successful and skilled entrepreneurs in Tanzania. Um, yet, what I also do find is that um, we need much more educated and skilled people and labor force here in Tanzania for companies to grow uh, at, at, a certain, uh, at a certain scale. But I think it's all about entrepreneurs and management, management, management. And I think every business school where you would go to uh, and you talk about investment strategies, eventually the idea is one thing, but um, most importantly is about your execution power and that really is um, in the hands of the entrepreneur. So it's really all about entrepreneur management, management, management. But Eva, there is a way that Bridget mentioned, scalability. What investors are looking about this way, the scalability? They're asking, uh, you, you know, your solution should be scalable. Are you talking about global scalability, in-country scalability, in-award scalability? You know, what's the scope of the word is scalability? I'll address that, but I first wanted to uh, address the other question, just because I feel there's a few people who are entrepreneurs in the room. Um, now, first of all, I don't know if you want an investor who will come in and control your business as a startup. Uh, at least at the early stage. But personally, I'm fine, you know, um, you put money, <laughs> put I your people. I don't know about that we, model. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, so it also sometimes is to protect you when you're talking about scale your team first, come in with a strong value proposition, and then we partner together. And then beyond just protecting you, uh, you have to appreciate that investors, at least on our continent, do not have very extensive teams. They and they have a very short window to invest because they are fundraising over 10-year cycles. So 
and they are required to invest in more than just your company. So it would be a bit of a stretch for them to come in and build with you, which is why they, they focus on the, 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 the team aspect. And the last one, and probably the one that's most important, and I see this a lot when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, is sometimes enterprise has the risk of being very focused on the product development or being technical experts. And as an investor, we're looking at you as more than the technical expert. You could have excellent skills in software development, we don't challenge that, but you want us to invest in you as a business. So we also want to see that you are more than a technical expert, we want to see you thinking like a business because that is when we are able to grow together to unlock the value of your business. So that aspect then is part of the reason why we may be hesitant to come in and do build, co-build with you uh, buy and build and encourage people to come in with the technical skills. I mean, the, tech, the leadership and the technical teams um, beyond the idea. But, but don't you think that you, if you invest and build, you could get millions of startups success? Or not. <laughs> and then the burden is left on me. <laughs> you know? uh, but to go back to your question about scale, now, Private equity and venture capital in East Africa is largely growth um, focused. And when we say growth, what we mean is we earn our money by being able to show the value in growing this business from point A to maybe 2A or 3A. And um, the, some of these various strategies for growth, um, and some of you have business school expertise, uh, but I'm just going to point to a few. So ability to grow either in terms of your market capture, if you're number three, moving to top two in the market share, ability to expand across a region or introduction of products. And largely that's the scalability that's looked at. It's not necessarily being so massive conquering the world, but is your business able to move to the next level? Remember, these are people who are going to at some point exit your business at a value that's hopefully attractive for their shareholders because they owe someone money and they have to give it back. So how can we realize profitability of your business? And that is what we mean when we say scale. It's not so much conquering Africa or conquering East Africa or conquering the world. It's scaling in a way that we get both of us, yourself as the owner and um, us as uh, supporting partners, uh, being able to realize the growth potential of your business. And I think that is something that both sides should be able to view positively and work towards. Back to you again. You are coming from Kenya. We've seen um, in East Africa, Kenya is, you know, is raising a lot as compared to, you know, to other countries. So what are the opportunities that are there that investors are seeing that we Tanzanians are not able to, you know, to, to, to attract those investments. Yeah, so EABCA sits in Kenya, Nairobi, and from there we have a regional mandate. We cover five countries, Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, Ethiopia, uh, as well as Kenya. And um, I think part of the reason there's a lot of inflow into the country is what Bridget Michael mentioned. There's a lot more people sitting there so they're able to identify and pick opportunities a bit faster because they're already on the ground. And that's one of the risks of not having a local presence, that some deals may not be within your, uh, your, your visibility. And it's a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, if you look to, at a country- To attract those investments. Yeah, if I just use that example, there's a lot more PEs that sit in Ethiopia. I think we have about nine right now nine Ethiopia-focused funds. And because they sit there, we are seeing a lot more activity in Ethiopia, so much so that in our study as EABCA, we found that after Kenya, Ethiopia was the next, uh, the next highest private equity activity um, hub for the region. So there's a direct relationship between people being on the ground and um, having, uh, being able to unlock the deals on the ground. So that's one. And then the other thing is, um, Someone mentioned it in the earlier panel. I, I think we have a bit of a, an aggressive culture, so people are able to push and show for themselves. Away. Does it mean because Tanzania started from socialism, that's a problem? No, I don't necessarily think so, but I, I just find that guys are a bit more, they want to get it done 
and get it done fast. So I think the only other people who rival that is Nigerians. Uh, if you've ever invested in Nigeria, Eric would know. Uh, it's a bit of a cutthroat place. So in that sense, I feel that guys will go out on the, to the market. I mean, you raise Series A, and then six months later, someone is raising Series B, and I'm like, didn't you just, why you just not in the market the other day? And the, we always want more money, we want more money. Um, so I think that also helps. But Bridget, okay. from, yes. from the interaction with the startups. Yeah? Can I say something, please? Uh, all right. What I have experienced sitting in, uh, in Tanzania is that Tanzania is doing one thing really good, is bringing negative, creating negative stories about itself um, in the newspapers, uh, locally and internationally. I think one thing, let's stop doing that. There's great opportunity in Tanzania, let's bring the good stories out. Um, and I think it reflects, <laughs> it, it reflects to investors because investors are reading the news. If, if, you know, if, you, if you look at CNN and we get these stories about Ebola, for instance, quite recently. So why is Tanzania in the news for Ebola? I really wonder. But these are international investors who then might think, well, let's not go into Tanzania. Um, there's other stories about, you know, um, having no opportunity to get your uh, work permits, your residency permits, what have you. We need to create an environment that enables investors to come. But that is all known. We should stop looking at neighbors like Kenya. Kenyans feel that they are great people. Um, but it will also bring the story about Kenya and then look at Tanzanians as being slightly different. I don't see any reason for Tanzanians to play the underdog. We should stop playing the underdog and bring the good stories out. There's plenty of good stories. Yeah. Thank you, Brigitte. I think you've been very open about uh, the many issues that are facing us. Let's go to Michael. There is this issue of uh, fair commission competition that um, uh, for an investor to invest in a company here in Tanzania, we need to go for the um, fair competition commission notification because um, they normally look at the threshold. Our threshold in Tanzania is very low, I understand. And the definition of the, um, how the major is supposed to be is also very difficult because it's looking at the global, and, um, uh, global assets and the global turnover of the buyer. So do you think this is the main reason that um, we are not able to attract investment in this, com in this country? Um, absolutely not. And you would hear the naysayers in Nairobi complaining about it, but it's, it's abs in my opinion, it's absolutely no barrier to foreign investment. All it is is, frankly, a, you know, it, you're looking at a delay of about six weeks to two months to complete a deal. Now, that's of course not ideal, but, um, but I wouldn't see it as a real barrier to foreign investment. I think if you were to look, you know, to really drill down into the fair competition legislation and procedures, etc. Now, I think the starting point is it's a good thing and it's right for Tanzania to have a framework, which they do, to examine the competition elements of, um, you know, of relevant, um, you know, mergers and acquisitions. If I was to have the freedom to, um, you know, to, to tweak the process and the legislation in any way, I think I would invite the um, FCC to perhaps look again at or to regularly review the relevant thresholds for notification. Now it was great, we saw the threshold increase pretty significantly about 18 months ago, which was wonderful. And um, so I think just to keep a regular review of, of, of that ongoing, because sometimes I think there is a perception amongst foreign investors is that there are deals that are going through the FCC process where there isn't really going to be an obvious effect on competition because the deal size is so low. Um, I think we applaud the fact that um, you know, the commissioners were, you know, the, the new commission was reappointed with 
you know, breakneck speed a couple of months ago, which is marvelous. And certainly compared to how things were two, three, four years ago, I mean, deals are getting reviewed by the FCC much more quickly. And we even saw a, you know, something must have been about two weeks ago um, where, you know, we had a colleague sitting with the FCC when they had a public hearing for a deal and the FCC actually issued the uh, clearance certificate and the merger analysis that very same day, which was, again, absolutely fantastic and you know, demonstrating these, you know, these mechanisms working as they should. But so just to answer your question, it's not a barrier. There are ways it could be streamlined, um, but definitely not a barrier. OK, great. So maybe now I can give a chance for the for the participants to, if there is any specific question to pose to the panelists. Uh, thank you. Um, I rarely speak in, uh, in public, but I expect I should speak. And particularly, I'm supporting the, uh, the great lady from the, uh, I stayed in Netherlands for about seven months. Uh, I'm reading this from the citizen. Three Tanzanians, Kennedy Murray, Petfrida Paul, and Felix Manyangote, ranked among 100 most influential young Africans 2019. Are you hearing this? So this business about uh, being aggressive or nothing, Tanzanians work very quietly but in great strides. We, we don't make a lot of noise, but there is, there is, there is noise coming. I, there are some countries who want to have Magufudi for a while on a higher purchase. <laughs> Why? Because you are doing great things. We don't make a lot of noise. Now, I wanted to say this because um, uh, what are these young people, what have they done? Kennedy Murray is a Tanzanian public relations, strategic communications, and digital marketing practitioner. Exactly what we are talking about here. And he founded and ran Serengeti Bytes, a full service communications, public relations, and digital media agency based in Dar es Salaam. Now, this other young guy, these are the 100, three. 100 influential Africans from Tanzania. I'd, I need not say anything more. Thank you. Thank you so much for the interesting uh, session. My questions go to uh, anyone in the panel as well as we were discussing about the investment issues. So I was just curious why investors or the venture capital uh, capitals they more interested in the organizations and they just forget the individuals. Just like me, I'm an author and I just want to publish something, but I was looking maybe for capital in order to do what I was intending to do. So I, I know maybe my work can be able to reach more people or more young people according to what I intended to reach the young people. So as investors or ventures, how are you looking in that case, in case you are more interested in the uh, organizations or someone who has a group or someone who has a company? What about this individual project, someone who is maybe want to be a singer, someone want to write something? How are you thinking about these individual issues? Thank you. I'm happy to kick off and just say something. I mean, I'm not an investor, but I work with lots of investors. And I can tell you that when people make an investment, they're not investing in the organization. It's all about the individuals and the management teams. That is absolutely critical, particularly in more challenging frontier markets like Tanzania, like East Africa. It is all about sitting across the other table, side of the table saying, do I trust this person? Do I like this person? Do I believe what they're saying? So, um, so I would think there certainly is an opportunity to attract capital. I guess the question is, you get how you're going to make money and then you need to basically convince the people with the money that if they give you a, if they give you a hundred thousand dollars that someday you're going to give them more back maybe now it's time to hear from the 
from the panelists, uh, what do they um, advise the startup community in Tanzania? Great. Um, so just to follow on, on what Michael said, indeed, investment is all about the people, not the business. A business, really, the definition of a corporation is, is, is vague. So if you start defining a business as an investment, you may falter, but it's the people and the ability for those people to execute a strategy. And then there may be, um, yeah, so it's about looking at yourself and the idea or uh, the concept that you have and how you can scale that and approaching someone who is aligned to you. Now, in addressing the startup community, uh, like I said, we represent East Africa, so Tanzania Enterprise is very much something we also push for uh, as an investment potential for foreign investors. And um, Tanzania is indeed a, a corridor for investment. By sitting in Tanzania, you have access to the East Africa community. You also have access to the SADC community. So you should think of yourself that, like that in terms of opening yourself up to opportunities. You can tap into the South or the East, and in the, I think that gives you a very strong vantage point. So keep doing what you're doing. Um, there is no difference to other entrepreneurs in other markets. In Ethiopia, they still have the same challenges as you may have. So at the end of the day, you believe in your vision and people will see that you are passionate about your vision and will be willing to put confidence in that passion. So keep the passion, keep the momentum and be patient. So I think even from your introduction, you were patient and you didn't give up. You just took the, sorry, took the feedback that people gave you and improved on it. So sometimes dealing with investors is not as fun, but keep at it and don't give up, and somehow, down the line, you will be rewarded for your efforts. Thank you, Eva. And we get, what should, maybe your last word to the startup community, what should they do? Oh, my last word, I'm, 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 I'm to one of many words, unfortunately, <laughs> so one last word is always difficult, that's a challenge. <laughs> Just speak the best one. It's more challenging than investing in Tanzania. Uh, no, I'm joking here. Um, so, for me, I think um, Tanzania is rich of uh, good entrepreneurs and I think um, a young population that is relatively ambitious enough um, to make it happen. And I also think there is enough capital available as long as we show the good examples. Um, for me, what is needed is really support um, from the regulator to create an environment that is really attractive for the investor and for the entrepreneur. Again, law enforcement, um, uh, and transparency on, on tax, um, um, uh, the ability to bring in expertise uh, from abroad if and when needed. Um, also, um, uh, education, a proper infrastructure, because if those aspects are not there, it's very expensive also to drive and run your business and to really grow it. So we need the support from the regulator and the government uh, to make it happen, because the ingredients are here, uh, are here in the room and are here at, um, at this conference. What I think is important is that uh, a conference like this, Sahara Sparks, is driven by entrepreneurs, very ambitious people, and I think, and I think we agree, all of us here on stage, we also work together and try to bring investors and the entrepreneurs together. And I think we should join forces in making the venture capital and private equity space in Tanzania a success. That's great. And Michael, in less than a minute, what's your last uh, word yeah. to the startup community? I, I think just to build on what Bridget is saying, you know, one thing that Bridget and I have been, you know, we, we've kind of joined forces over the last couple of years and, you know, and obviously with, with Germano as well, trying to catalyze the investment ecosystem here in Tanzania. The, the thing that, 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 that struck me after, I think I'd been living here for maybe almost five years, and I'd never met Germano. And you just think, the problem we find here, particularly in Dar, is it, the communities can be very, very fragmented. And unless there are specific focal points, and stakeholders working together to bring everyone together, then opportunities get lost. 
So this is why you know Sahara Sparks is such a fast, you know, fantastic event. I think you know the more we can do to think about what other events we need to do to try and help you know you know grow that early stage, because you know as I was saying earlier, the crazy thing is it's not like the money isn't there. There are these huge pots of capital sat there with people saying, right, I want to invest in Tanzanian businesses, but at the moment. Like we're just struggling to be able to join the dots. So I think you know if we continue to work together to do more, um, we can help to act, you know get that capital into the places where it needs to be. And um, you know we have more Tanzanian successful stories in terms of not just startups but large flourishing businesses. So um, you know it's of course it's challenging, but it's super exciting and. Um, yeah, watch this space. More news coming soon. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for this. Hello. Thank you so much for being patient. Um, if this repeats to lower my blood pressure, here's why. If you're over 50. Again, thank you so much for being patient and for coming on. Um, from now henceforth, we will try to see how we can be creating opportunities for us to learn about investment from experts. And some of them would be documentaries or, or um, very suitable videos like we just watched. Some of them would be actual people professionals from around the world, like we did last week, that we are going to bring here on board. It is extremely critical that when we come, a few of us that are coming on Zoom, that um, we are able to take notes and we are prepared to, to, to ask questions either on the chat or when the video ends. Again, Sierra Leone and the other countries that are represented here can only be built by the citizens from those countries. And um, it, is, it is our responsibility to also help circulate this message because, because from now henceforth, I believe we'll be broadcasting it on YouTube. Um, we are going to allow this space for the multimedia of transit to begin to lead this space so that we can focus on building the agro-business, we can focus on building the, the capital investments that we've started, and also the transit, the college that we've started, and also work along with others who would come along with us that are doing similar businesses or different businesses, but in the same space in the same country, and see how we can be able to harness capital. Without capital, it's difficult to unlock um, entrepreneurial um, spirit in any country, no matter how visionary you are without capital, it's difficult to move anything. So let us continue for those of us that believe in prayer, let's continue to pray. And for those of us that are walking on the ground doing different things, let's continue to commit, let's continue to hang around this space. Now, um, I see a few people here. Um, I can turn it over to Mr. Toba as we conclude. Um, Amos, are you here? Mr. Amos, it's like I see you here. Can you hear me? Hello, Amos. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We're just in conclusion. We just closed. Hello, are you there? Yeah, we're here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we heard you. We're hearing Hello. you. Hello. We're hearing you. Hello. Can we? Yes. Hello. Hello, we hear you. Hello. Amos, we can hear you, my brother. Anybody has any questions? Maybe while we're waiting for the questions, can we quickly introduce ourselves, we that are here? all the way to the end. I'm Steve, Steve Mansouray from Sierra Leone and I'm based here, I'm connecting from Boston. 
Can we quickly, the few of us that are here, Adrian go ahead. Lebo, Adrian Lebo, um connecting from Maryland. Welcome, sir. So, I am Tapia Boy Makonte, connecting from Sri Lanka. Welcome, sir. <laughs> Um, Adama Bengur from Philly. Welcome, Mrs. Yeah. Sarah Nguenya from Zambia. Welcome, Africa. welcome, welcome, Sister Sarah. Amos, can you hear us now? You muted again. Amos, you're muted. So uh, for some of us, is there anything that we that stood out for you on the on the videos that we've watched? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, okay. I good evening, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or uh, good morning, wherever you are, you know, you are joining us from. So for me, I think um the videos they have been very informative. And um yeah, um, for me really it's is also um, a, be a better guide for me as far as, you know, a PE is concerned. You know, I know that talking about the challenges and, you know, the opportunities, uh, the resilience and all those things, you know, I mean, looking at all the speakers. So it shows that it's, uh, it presents a lot of uh, opportunities, you know, um, not only in the developed world and also in the African countries you know, like ours. Uh, like. Yeah. Reference said on that time, and we can't wait for anyone to actually build a, a continent and country for us. So we, we the citizens, we the indigenous, right, will actually be the one to actually build and create values because most of the values created by the foreigners that are being repatriated, right, they don't fit, you know, with the African countries. So they are repatriated to their own countries. So um, if we talk about the real development, the real value, we will be the one to actually take the bull by the own and create the value and make the value have impacts. So um, for me, it's been a very great video and a pleasure of things, you know, for me. Uh, so um, periodically like that, I mean, we'll continue to actually sanitize ourselves, you know, with uh, high quality materials such as this, you know, and all that. Uh, thank you. I uh, thank everybody, you know, for your time and for patience, you know, staying for the last uh, one, one hour on the call. Thank you, Amos. Now, quickly to Amos, before please stay with us, Amos, quickly. Does anybody have anything that stood out that you want to share very briefly? Yes, of course. Um, um, of course, um, I can hear again from Australian, and I really had um, the opportunity to learn from those uh, speakers, and yeah, it was. Yeah, and a question that was asked, though that time was disconnected again, but then it came out glaringly that I will also ask on that. Then um, there was a lady who asked a question if uh, having an idea, individual, because some companies are what people, you might have a business idea and it will develop others, but um, by look of things, people will really not trust because it's an individual that uh, maybe will walk away with money or will do this one. But um, that question was very paramount, and I think we have to look at it because as investors, you must also see if an idea is being found in an individual, will you support that person? Will you support an individual idea? That is what really stood out for me. Thank you. Yes. Um... Does anybody remember the answer that um, the guy, the white dude that was there that gave an answer to that lady? Does anybody, can anybody um, summarize it for us? Anyone? Um, not for me. It was kind of hard to like, I think I don't know if it's my phone. That was really hard for me to understand the thing. I think the volume was low, I would okay. say. Okay. Maybe we'll yeah. try to work on all those technical issues next Sunday. But his summary was that at the end of the day, it is you that have to sell yourself and your idea and the person sitting across you that has the money will be able to trust you with that money. 
so that if they give you a hundred thousand that you know a couple of years later um they will be able to get more from that i think one of the things that they kept emphasizing for me that i saw is that they are talking about the people the management team or the individual whoever is it so you may have a great idea but the analysis is you are you capable to execute this brilliant idea you've just explained are you trustworthy is what is the vision of what you're saying can it be trusted can it be executed so that when they put their money so it, you know they can get it back so it is for us to be able to build up ourselves to to develop that trustworthiness that capability to move things forward and i think starting small and building from there helps you to gain credibility as you go step by step so that there is something you can point to and keep building. So if you're a writer, write. Are you contributing in articles? Are you, do people know you are writing anything? You know, in your community even, you know, um, those type of things, I think. So I don't know if somebody else has any other contribution or if you have any other thoughts that you learned. Um, for me, I just want to say something. I pick up few stuff from, mm -hmm. even though it was kind of hard for me to like hear what they were saying because the volume was low. Yeah. But one thing that I picked up was the fact that they mentioned that investment in Africa is a high risk, mm -hmm. um, which I've always said to people <laughs> back in my country that investing in our country, it, it's, it's considered a high risk because of the, the way things are flowing and the way things are going. But well, one other thing that I picked up from the other lady, she said, you don't have to give up and you have to be patient. So that's still out to me, especially when it comes to investment. You really have to be patient. And sometimes you can lose, but don't give up. Just continue doing what you're doing as long as you have faith. And um, you're just being consistent with it. And definitely you're going to succeed. So. Thank you so much, Adama. Those are very uh, relevant and very critical points that you've made. Um, so is there anyone else that wants to share your thoughts? What you remember as we, sh as we, as we wrap up this meeting? Okay, uh, maybe in closing, what I would like to say is again to say thank you to all of you. And uh, maybe my final comment would be like they advise, are there opportunities in Africa? All of them. There was no question as to whether opportunities are there. Are these opportunities scalable? Can it grow to a point that will make lots of money for the investors? Absolutely. So if there are opportunities, and these opportunities can be scaled. And they also, are, they, the lady from Net, the Netherlands clearly said that the monies are actually already in Africa. It is just how can you tap into this money? So the money is there. The opportunities are there. These opportunities can be scaled. So the question is, how can we now connect to it? It's like electricity being supplied in your house. And yet you don't know how to really connect to it so that your bulb can light up, so that you can use you can use whatever plug to put on the wall, and you don't have the plug. What we and then the way, but they said that that plug to connect to the money comes with you, you the individual, the expert you're putting together, the team you're building. How capable are they? What are their skills? And then can you be trusted? So the question is really self-transformation now. It's, it's not about the challenges anymore in Africa alone and all the other risk factors. It is more so about myself as Steve. You know, it's also about yourself. What are your dreams? Where do you want to go? And what changes do I need to do in my life and my professional life? Where do I need to start? And what team can I build around me? for me to be able to go from point A to 2A. <laughs> you know, people usually say from point A to B, but today I could hear the lady say from point A to 2A and 3A. I like that, I really do. 
Um, so, um, so I think that is, I think that is clear because I don't want us to leave without clearly putting our finger on what it is that we need to do to be able to achieve the reason why we left everything at this moment to come to this channel and listen and patiently wait. It's so it's all zeroed on you and on me. Our, our, our approach to things, how we're doing our things, let us be patient, let us be resilient, let us, let us don't give up and let's keep going and keep transforming ourselves and building a very solid and credible team around us as we move our vision forward. I truly believe that Sierra Leone and the other countries can honestly play a significant part as we partner together and collaborate together in leading the 21st century African market development. I really believe that. And I know others will when people from this channel start becoming millionaires, start you know, doing things that are huge in the space. And that's the time maybe they'll come back and listen to all these audios that and all these videos that we are doing now. So we will archive them. We are determined. And as the, the, the transit media takes over at least this channel, uh, because now for the investment part, we can meet every Sunday. We would meet when it's absolutely necessary, which I think would happen very shortly in order to launch the, um, so that people can start putting in their resources and there's a clear plan, a clear direction. But until then, we'll continue the educational channel, the engagement, the discussion, bringing in the experts as transit TV channel is moving now in that direction. So thank you again. I appreciate you so much. As always, stay in transit. Don't go anywhere. Thank you so much. And God bless. Thank you very much. <laughs> you. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Mr. Adrian, I hope you didn't want to say anything when I closed. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so we'll meet again next next Sunday. We'll bring so yes, thank you. Yeah, God bless. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Yes, Mr. Yeah.